Hi, and welcome to Political Theory in 30 Seconds. Won't be quite 30 seconds, but we're going to zip through this. So we start out with classical political thought. This is our thought promoted by people like Plato and Aristotle, writing in the 400s and the 300s BCE. To them, politics was the realization of human excellence, that government and politics should be about helping man, and of course that was the term they would have used, foster virtue. And they looked at questions of justice. This really captured a lot of people's minds for a long time. We went through having this as sort of our foundation of what political thought was for centuries. And we have some of the church thinkers, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, uh, but for the most part, things don't really change dramatically until the 17th century when Hobbes and Locke start writing. Thomas Hobbes and then John Locke after him wrote about social contract theory. And this may be familiar to you from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote after Hobbes and Locke. However, he also wrote after the American Revolution. So we won't be talking about his take on social contract theory, even though he is one of the thinkers behind the theory. He's not relevant to us. So Hobbes really looked at government in a different way. Stop becoming about justice and virtue, started becoming, well, why do we have government? We don't really just to strive for justice, this doesn't seem right. And he and Locke both, in different ways, started describing this original state of nature. This idea that before we have government, before we have anything, we have an original state of nature. So back when humans were living in caves and hunters and gatherers, really even before hunting and gathering. We had no semblance of society at all. Now, at this time, as Hobbes puts it in Leviathan, life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And the reason for that is we have absolute freedom. I'm thinking, absolute freedom? How does that make life nasty, brutish, and short? Well, the problem is, is if I have absolute freedom, that means that I have the freedom to kill whomever I want, right? It might not be the first thing I want to do with that freedom, but I could do it. So let's say we're living in prehistoric earth and no society, no groups of people, and I happen to be going around and what do I need? Well, I need shelter and I need food. I also need clean water right? Sort of very basic, fundamental things in order to survive. So wandering around and I find a decent cave, right? Some good shelter. Yay! It also happens to be near a stream that provides fresh water. However, there's really no food source around. Very few bushes that grow any sort of berries, not much to eat. But hey, it's dry and there's water nearby. I'll take it. But I'm wandering around in search of food one day and I see another cave. This is a better cave. It's still along that same stream, still provides shelter, but right outside it are these great big berry bushes. Yes, this will be great. Now I don't have to wander around in search of food. Food is right there. Problem is, is there's someone already living there. So what do I do? Well, I wait till they're asleep. And I get a big rock and knock them over the head. Now I have the cave. They're not living there. I am. How great for me. But the thing is, is someone else could come along and do that to me. So what could I do instead? Well, maybe instead of killing that person, instead of exercising my freedom, I could talk to them. And I could say, hey, listen, I was going to kill you but I figure someone else is gonna come by and do that to me. So instead, here's the deal. You stay here, guard the cave, and I'll go out and look for even better food and meat. And then I'll come back with it. And then you can have some of it and guard the cave. Maybe we'll take a nap. 
right? And then you sleep and I guard the cave. Isn't this a great deal? So it is, right? I now have shelter, food, water, and some guarantee of protection. But in getting that guarantee of protection, at least the guarantee that that person won't kill me and will attempt to watch out for me so others don't kill me, by doing that, I've traded a little bit of my freedom because in exchange for their protection of me, I'm also agreeing to not hurt them. I'm protecting them by not exercising my freedom. So in essence, I've traded a little bit of freedom for a little bit of protection. And this is all fine, but there's only the two of us. And someone comes by who's done it with another person, who's done this sort of agreement with someone else. And they come and they have big rocks and they could kill us. But maybe, maybe we say, hey, let's all work together. It's a lot easier to hunt food when one person can beat the bush and the other person can then shoot at the birds that come out of the bush or throw a rock and we don't have thumb. In this scenario, we probably don't have weaponry yet, but throw a rock at the bird that came out of the bush, right? That's, that's great. But that requires two people, which means we'd be leaving the cave unattended. So these other two people can help us with that. And by doing this, we slowly create a society. It's a self-governing society, but it is, in essence, a government. And we've sacrificed a little bit of our power, of our freedom rather, for someone to protect us. And what Hobbes says is that we give this uh, sort of sacrifice, we sacrifice our freedom in exchange for protection by giving someone power over us, right? That person is the Leviathan. Now, in Locke's theory, it is not always a Leviathan. And in Locke's theory, he says that when we do this, when we sacrifice a little bit of our freedom for our security, we are entering into a social contract. This government that we have sacrificed some of our freedom to and given them some power to protect us, by doing this, we've entered into a contract with that government. And if that government abuses their power, takes away too much of our freedom, if they become tyrannical, we actually not only have the right, but the obligation to overthrow that government because they have broken the contract and we must overthrow them and enter into a new form of government, one that better protects the social contract. And this idea that we are obligated to overthrow a tyrannical government was Locke's contribution to social contract theory. And certainly this idea inspired Thomas Jefferson and the other founding fathers when they wrote things like the Declaration of Independence, which we're going to look at in our next classes.